Yeah, so our first speaker is Stuart Stiles. He's an engineer and teacher at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with the Internet um, Irrigation Training and Research Center. And they've done some really valuable uh, studies on different irrigation systems and monitoring systems and uh, throughout California, all the way from furrow irrigation to flood irrigation. What's that? To drip irrigation to uh, micro sprinklers. Um, so with that, Stuart Stiles, would you like to begin your presentation? Yes. Yes, that's a permanent, yes. I can, I'll do it in this mode here. This will work perfect. Okay, so I, I tried to cut this down um, as much as I could, but there's a couple of key points uh, that I wanted to cover. So I'm gonna hit those key points and stay within my 30 minute window here. Um, but I, I just posted in the chat uh, room, in the chat box, uh, chat area there, I posted uh, links to a lot of the things that I'm gonna reference here. So, so you could have those and have them kind of as a handout here um, as I go through this presentation. Um, I know there's a lot of links there and I'll try to make sure I give everybody an idea what's, what's on those links. Um, so my goal was to try to go through and, and kind of hit on the talking points for a good irrigation uh, system design. So that's what I'm going to kind of handle here. So I, my topics, I'm going to start with the drip basics. Um, the second thing is the thing I'm going to emphasize the most in this talk is, you know, what are the basic questions you're supposed to ask? If you're a, if you're a grower and you're trying to make a, a large investment out there, you know, what are the things that you should be looking for um, when you're talking to an irrigation dealer? And, and unfortunately, you know, um, there's a lot of questions and I don't have all the answers in a 30 minute presentation, but I, I think it's important um, if you're gonna make this huge investment and upgrade your system or, or switch from drip to micro spray, there's a lot of key things you really wanna um, ask. And then the third part on um, measuring performance, I'm gonna kind of lightly touch on that to introduce the topic. And then the next session is gonna really get into the details on measuring performance. So, so that's what I'm gonna try to cover. So I'm gonna start with the drip basics. Um, so what do you think about when you're thinking about uh, doing a drip design? So, you know, one of the basic things is, is whether you're looking at drip or micro spray. Um, drip ir irrigation is, um, is great. It has a lot of advantages. Um, if you have a tree out there and you have five or six emitters um, and one of them gets plugged, you still are getting water to your tree. So there's a lot of advantages to that situation. Uh, micro spray. Uh, a lot of folks like the micro spray because it puts out a much wider pattern and gets the the soil uh, soil moisture in a larger area um, with one emitter. But again, you're you're if you have any kind of plugging or any kind of problem uh, malfunction with that sprinkler, that one sprayer, your tree is not going to get any water. So it requires a little bit more uh, um, visual inspection in the field. You know, if things are working, that kind of thing. So. Um, one of the things that we talk about quite a bit are these new uh, types of products called PC products, which is a term for pressure uh, compensating products. So most of the drip emitters, um, I don't know if my camera's working, I got some visual aids here too, but um, the PC products are pretty, uh, pretty much the standard out there now. And you really don't get anything but PC emitter uh, products out there. The, 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 the uh, premium to pay for PC is really not that much with emitter products. Can you see my visual on the camera? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. I, sorry, I just can't see what you guys can see. So um, so these, this is a Netapin product. This is a PC product, been around forever, works great. A lot of guys use them. A lot of folks think this is the, the best thing out there for drip irrigation and uh, performance-wise they do slide. really well. They, the larger ones, the one and two gallon per hour ones don't plug very quickly. Um, very easily. Stu, we're not seeing your next slide. Um, okay. So the testing that we've been doing up here, um, we've been testing these uh, PC products. And so this is one of the first reports I wanted to reference and it's on the okay. chat link if you would like to take a look at it. Um, we were very interested to see if the performance of the product matched what the manufacturer's uh, literature said. And so this is a, a couple of graphs of the Netafim products and you can see that, um, you know, the blue line is pretty flat there, um, you know, as long as it gets uh, past a minimum pressure. And, and that's the key to um, having these emitters, these new PC type products work, 
is they have to get past a minimum pressure and then they'll they'll give you a constant flow rate. So you can see on the uh, on the upper graph there, as soon as it gets up above seven psi, it starts giving you a pressure compensating characteristic. Below seven psi, it's not it's not in a PC mode. It's basically working like a regular emitter. And on the one on the bottom, the pressure is up about twelve psi. And these are two Netafim products, and you have to kind of know what that minimum pressure is for your product that you have in the field, because otherwise, if you're dropping below that pressure, you're not getting that benefit of having a PC product. And, and that's been one of the key problems that we've seen with PC products out in the industry is that they're not necessarily um, publishing that number or the farmers, the growers out there aren't, aren't necessarily aware of it or the designers kind of ignore it. And once it drops below that point, it's not actually doing its job. So, so a lot of folks um, that are doing uh, avocados uh, do micro sprayers and uh, they're paying the extra cost for the PC products on the micro sprayers. And what my observation has been is that um, the pressures uh, required to make them work in a PC mode are rare to find out in the field. It's, it's not very common to see the, that the laterals, especially on hillsides, to see that they're actually um, above the minimum pressure requirements. So what you get is you don't get the performance that you're looking for. So we did the same type of testing on the um, PC micro sprayers. And you can see that, that the minimum pressure um, on the first one up there, it's about 15. The second one is up there around 20, 25. Um, the third one is about 20. And the fourth one there is about 20, 25. And the problem is you go out in the field, if you have 15 PSI, it's basically not giving you that pressure compensating characteristic. And then the other thing you notice is that the curves are kind of wavy. And so they're, they're not as, um, it's not as, as well engineered as the as the drip emitter. So you might be paying a premium for a PC micro sprayer and you might not be getting the performance that you actually expected. And this shows up in the uh, performance calculations and the performance assessment that we do later here. So with drip, you got to do filtration and you got to have good filtration. And there's a lot of products on the market out there right now that can do uh, filtration. Uh, the biggest problem that I've seen when I've seen the different systems is uh, um, a lot of them only work if the water's uh, clean. So um, if, you, if you don't have clean water, if you have sand in your well, if you have algae, if you have any kind of material that's going to um, provide any kind of a, a plugging issue, um, you need to do something like sand media tanks because that's going to be the one thing that's going to really uh, help filter your products. Um, you know, the, the filtering size that we're dealing with is really small. Um, typically, you want to filter down to one tenth of the smallest pathway that you have in your product. So if a drip emitter has a, a pathway of an eighth of an inch, you want to go down to one tenth of that value. So it can be a very small value that you need to filter down to. So we've done a lot of work on uh, media tanks and trying to determine the which ones perform better than others. Uh, what we found is that the underdrain designs is the key to how these things work. And I know a couple of these have gone out of manufacturing. This report was from 2012. But uh, what we did is we, we tried to show- This is the Arkel um, sand media tank at 240 GPM. I'm gonna let her talk here We see second. large boils in the center and small boils surrounding the center. So, so that sand media tanks, what we found is that the back flush um, that they would have preferential flow on some of the designs. And so what we did is identified in a report which ones were performing better than others. And since that report came out, which has been about 10 years ago now, um, there's been a huge shift in the industry on the manufacturing of those tanks and how they do the, the installation on those. Um, you know, back in the day, we used to talk about whether you wanted to do fertigation or not. I think this is a pretty standard practice across the board with most growers in California whether they're injecting sulfuric acid or KTS or some other product out there. Um, most growers have seen the benefit of doing uh, spoon feeding with their fertilizers. And that's, that's a key um, item. And I wanna mention here, I don't have a slide on this, but um, we've updated our, our fertigation book, which is an industry book that we use for training classes and all kinds of good stuff. And we've put it online for free now. It's a, available as a free do uh, download. All you need to do is provide us your email address and um, we don't get that email address, just so you know, for um, sending out lots and lots of literature. Uh, we do it because we found it's cheaper and, and more effective for us to, to get uh, the, the uh, 
funding agencies to cover the costs for putting these things together and then just reporting back that we actually have real people downloading these books kind of a thing. So we've kind of gone away from trying to sell books, the hard copy books now. Um, I want to mention berry drip because I every once in a while I get a question on berry drip on avocados and, and I just say no. I, I just <laughs> say no, don't do it. Um, it's, it's a real challenge to get berry drip to work at all. And with the um, soils that we have, um, it, it's just not conducive to uh, that type of irrigation. There's a couple other variations on berry drip where they're just putting one tube down. And um, I'm gonna still just say, uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, we've had challenges everywhere we put them in, we've had challenges on that. Um, let's see, so if you do decide you wanna do buried roots, this is a good slide I got from one of the UC guys that uh, was working on it, is you gotta be really careful because you will shank the roots. And uh, you know, obviously you're gonna get uh, some impact on your trees if you do something like that. So what about, what about yield? Um, yield. It, you know, the, obviously the, the questions, the bigger questions are, you know, if you're gonna go out and invest the system, is it gonna affect the yield out there? And uh, from everything that's, that's been out there, I mean, obviously with drip irrigation, you're gonna get an improved yield with, uh, um, with going to the, the, the spoon feeding the water and spooning, spoon feeding the fertilizers to the system. So it's really not a question anymore. All right, so how about the cost? Man, this thing is just right in the middle of everything I typed. Um, all right, so how about the cost? If you're looking at cost, you gotta be careful because there's a big initial cost, but you know, it, there's this annualized cost too that's associated with drip irrigation. And so you wanna look at all the costs. Um, how about looking at hydraulic design? Um, most of the growers out there don't really wanna talk about hydraulics. They wanna uh, put this in the hands of, a, of an engineer at the local design firm and let them make all these decisions about how they're gonna size the pipe and, and what kind of uh, lengths they're gonna have on runs and and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues associated with hydraulics, but it, it gets pretty boring pretty quick. Um, or at least it, it gets, it can bog you down on, on you know, what are the details and, and why are we doing you know, four inch versus three inch and, and all those little things. But, but they're actually really important when you're doing the system. Um, you, just, you just need to know what questions are, you should be asking if you're gonna go out and talk to one of the dealers or compare two dealer quotes to each other or three dealer quotes to each other. All right, so let's see. So, so what are the questions to ask? You know, if you're, if you're gonna be that grower that's trying to make that decision, what are the basic things you're supposed to ask out there? So the way I set this up is I wanna try to kind of go through some basic hydraulics here. The first thing is, is that all of your emitters are not gonna put out, or sprayers, they're not gonna put out the same amount of water. There's gonna be differences based on the pressure differences you have out in the field out there. So you can specify this performance. You can say, I want to have 0.9 uniformity, or I can, you can say, I wanna have 0.5 uniformity. I don't care if the trees all get different amount of water or that I have to put on twice as much water because of the, 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 the um, application of the water is so non-uniform out in the field. So you can specify that you want it at 0.9 or just tell them you don't care, and then someone can give you a design that's at 0.5 uniformity. So I'll, I'll define uniformity in a second. So we can predict what those discharges will be, what the flows will be out in the system by doing a basic design, going through the hydraulics. We know what the pressures will be, and then we know what those flows will be. Um, a good designer is going to give you this information. He's going to provide all the backup for it to show you how he came up with those calculations. Um, if he's waving his hands a lot when he's explaining this to you, it's probably not a good sign. <laughs> okay. um, so they have the tools, you know, the growers that, that are going to ask these questions, they need to be working with a good designer that has these tools. They know where to put the manifolds, they know how long to make the hose runs, they know the optimum diameter of the hoses and the pipes out in the system, they know the correct inlet pressures, they know how to uh, properly flush, flush the hoses and put this information in the grower's hands after the system's been installed. So a lot of this stuff is in our book, and I, I know in half an hour here, I can't get on all my talking points. So if you'd like to get a copy of the book, it's available for free. Um, I put the links on the website or on the chat box. So the way we've set this up is we have set up a series of questions for growers to ask, and we call it the Irrigation Consumer Bill of Rights. This, this isn't new. This has been around for 20 plus years now. Um, we've refined it. We've updated it. We've added some new ones um, to it. So it, it basically is trying to, to let the growers know what questions they should go in 
and ask from the dealers. And then they should kind of document what one dealer's telling them and document what the other dealer's telling them. And then get, get some kind of an idea of, um, of the differences in the responses. You know, if somebody's not willing to give you answers, it's probably not a good person to buy the equipment from. So uh, one of the problems that we, we've identified early on in DRIP is that there's really low margins in this industry. And there's really no backup service. You know, they, they, it goes out in the field and it's like, good luck, you know. And uh, there's really no standards. Um, ITRC has tried to put standards out and specifications out. And we've worked for years and years and years on this, but um, there's no uh, mandatory uh, standards for the performance out there, the, the dealer performance on the irrigation system. So what you end up with is a whole bunch of poorly installed products. And, um, you know, just to be blunt here, a lot of uh, poorly manufactured uh, products that, that aren't good for the industry. And so that's what we've really tried to kind of address here in some of the things that we've done is try to help growers, um, you know, make those business decisions based on, you know, numeric values and, and assessments and not just, a, you know, a salesperson's, uh, you know, pitch here. So, um, so what we're seeing is we're seeing poor equipment, we're seeing poor installation, we're seeing uh, lousy designs, and uh, we're seeing a price-driven market instead of a quality-driven market. So, so you, you, you just basically get what you pay for. Um, if you're going to go out there and buy things on cost and not buy, buy things based on an on a expectation of the quality of the, of the delivered product here. So, so the dealers, you know, the good ones are having trouble competing. And uh, that's changing over the last 20 years. I've, I've seen a shift. We've got more and more good dealers that are coming in out there. Um, the growers don't know the questions, much less what the answers are supposed to be. And then the good, the good manufacturers, I should probably say it this way, the good manufacturers suffer because there's always going to be these manufacturers that are coming in and throwing uh, lower cost products um, and, and claiming that it worked great in Florida or it worked great in Australia. Sorry, I had to throw that in. I heard you talking about Australia. That, um, you know, there's, there's these manufacturers that come in and just claim they have all these great products and they're working for us. And we just haven't seen that in the, in the uh, uh, performance assessment in the field here. So the, the consumer, you know, they're just looking at initial price and it's really uh, heavily dependent on who's selling the product to you. And then we have a lot of product adoption that seems like it's regional. You know, you go up in the Visalia area and they're all using this kind of a filter. You go in the central coast here, there's different products that are being uh, um, implemented. And a lot of times it's kind of hard to figure out, you know, where that, that came from, where that idea came from. And a lot of times it's just the growers talking at the coffee shop or, or online now, I guess. Um, so let's see. So what's the question? What, you know, is this system going to be a, um, is it going to be a total system that you're purchasing or are you going to buy little parts and pieces and put them together out in your field out there? You know, you can buy parts and pieces and, and try to get your costs lower, but the, how is it going to perform as a system is, is, is a real basic question here. Um, do you consider the system to be an expense generator, uh, an expense or an income generator? Are you, are you going into this to try to make money and, and looking at the long term, the 10 year, 20 year number, or are you just trying to um, you know, write off this expense from a current year um, you know, expense format? So let's see. So if you only look at the expense side, you're, you're looking at this as a commodity purchase. And this is where we've had this problem with drip irrigation. It's, it's really not a commodity. It shouldn't be treated as one. You know, it needs to be treated as a whole package, as a system, and that we're looking at these different uh, performance characteristics here. So, so a lot of the dealers, you know, they, they have these problems. They have these issues. Um, there's no requirement for a contractor's license. Um, there's no commissioning service that's provided on this. Um, usually they don't have uh, high level engineers that are working on designs. You know, they, they require that the lower level staff are kind of working on these things. So it, it creates a lot of the problems out there. So, so these questions that we've generated, it, it really helps you kind of go through and figure out what the, gen the questions are. We've, We've done three categories, this general one for irrigation systems, a, spe a specific one for drip micro irrigation, and then this new thing that seems to be really kind of overtaking the, the discussion out there on drip irrigation right now is what type of soil moisture monitoring should you be doing? And uh, there's a lot of products out here on soil moisture monitoring. And the new program uh, that's available from the states, this, they call it the SWEET program. There's a, there's a lot of uh, grant money that's available for growers to pay for systems. And a lot of the growers are using soil moisture monitoring for the, the foundation to get a $100,000 grant or a $50,000 grant. And that SWEET program, I don't have a slide on it, but I have the link on it on my on the chat box. The SWEET program um, is expected to get funded by two to three times more money this year than they had last year. And last year they had about 40 million. So it's, a, it's an excellent program for growers to 
to uh, participate in if you're interested. So let's see, so some of the questions on the general bill, you know, how do you select a dealer? You know, again, you know, if you really look at it, we're, we're not gonna try to give you answers here, but I'm kind of trying to lead you in the right direction here. You know, it'd be nice if it was a registered professional engineer, or at least they had a CID certificate from the Irrigation Association, a, a certified irrigation designer certificate. Um, they should have a contractor's license. They should have some experience. They should have some uh, references that they can give you uh, for the dealer uh, credentials here. Um, should we mandate certification for irrigation system design? I've been working on that for 30 years, and uh, I think the answer is yes. But uh, yeah, good luck with trying to implement certification out there on an industry that hasn't been regulated at all. So um, I don't think that's going to happen in my career. Um, let's see. So some of the things that we're looking for, the life expectancy, you know, um, is this a 10 year product or is it a 20 year or can we expect to get 40 years like like things on like our buried pipelines, for example? Um, can we get a list of the spare parts that are going to be needed so that we need to do this replacement? If you're if you're needing to get uh, emitter products and things like that, you need to make sure that these things don't go out of business. So you want to have a, a bucket or two of, of these products that you can uh, you know put in place afterwards. So so the last part of this is um, how uniform is your system, and and this is going to lead into our next talk. So I'm going to not cover too much on these slides, but you need to specify um, a uniformity. You'd like to know what the uniformity is going to be right off the get go. So today is it going to be 0.9 or 0.95? But you also want to specify what it's going to be after five years or 10 years with good management. Now, a lot of times the uniformity can go down just because the, the, uh, the grower didn't uh, do the maintenance, the required maintenance on a system. So, so it might go down to, say, 0.85. But, but it's good to just understand that the uniformity, the brand new uniformity should be a target value. And then the irrigation system design should be based on a, a longer term uh, uniformity value. So this is basically what uniformity is. I, I know those aren't avocado trees, but you get the basic idea here. If you have lousy uniformity, the trees or the plants on one part of the system aren't gonna get enough water and the trees on the other part of the system are gonna get too much water. So it's a real basic idea. Um, we use a mathematical calculation on this. We go out in the field and we put a bunch of buckets out and we take the average of the low quarter of the uh, water caught in the buckets. And then we take it over the average of the whole uh, system. And then we get this uniformity value. So it's pretty standard. We've been doing these evaluations for the last, I don't know, 35 years, 30 something years. And uh, it's, it's a standardized procedure and we can come up with what these uniformity values are out in your field. So this is just a, a um, look at the results that we've had. Uh, this is a 20 year time period. Um, it just gives you an idea what the performance values are on the system. So the, 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 Takeaway on this is there's a whole lot of systems, about 200 systems that are performing under what our expectations were, and and a majority, a vast majority here, are performing at or above our expectations. So, so there are some lousy systems out there, but there are a lot of good systems too. So, um, so let's see. I'm going to skip energy and water requirements because I'm cutting short on time here, and I want to get to this flow measurement question. So. In the, in the state right now, we have a couple of uh, new laws that have been put in place, uh, SB 88 and uh, SB or, or the uh, Sigma law, which isn't an SB, I think that's an AB law. So they're requiring that we put meters everywhere. And, um, and it's a real challenge because a lot of the systems um, on the central coast here have pumping systems that kind of look like our example here from Salinas, where there's not a good place to put a flow meter. Now, the good news is, is there's a lot of new uh, flow meters on the market. There's a lot of these uh, magnetic meters and other types of meters, and we've come up with some some good suggestions, good recommendations on um, on putting these in. But um, let's say you're using a propeller meter and you don't have the required 10 diameters upstream and the five diameters downstream. What we've been working on with a lot of the growers now um, to meet these state requirements for both Sigma and for uh, SB88 is to put flow conditioning in. So that's that's been a real uh, challenge is to try to, uh, to determine where we got to uh, make these changes and then to, to work with the growers to, to do things like the flow conditioner. Now, now this the flow conditioner that uh, Macrometer sells, it's it's, um, you know, they have the products from, I think, four up to 12 inch. And what it does is it changes that classic 10 diameters upstream and five diameters downstream all the way down to uh, three and one, three diameters upstream and one diameter downstream. And even when we have a tangled uh, mess, like we have up here on this, this uh, example, um, we can actually, you know, most of the time we can get a propeller meter to work in that application. 
one of the other challenges we have is that um, all of these sites need to be tested. And so um, pump testing is, is now gonna probably be the standard norm in the future uh, because part of the pump testing is to evaluate your well performance, but also we can use that to verify your flow, flow accuracy on your, on your meters. And um, we've been working with some manufacturers on their portable testing equipment. Uh, Panometrics is one of the companies where we can actually go in on these really tight spacings and then verify that the accuracy is, is correct um, on these sites. I know I spend a little bit extra time on that. And the reason is, is that we're spending a lot of time on that we're, with growers trying to uh, fulfill their, um, currently we're trying to help uh, a bunch of growers up in the Monterey County area fulfill their requirements for the SB88 uh, um, deal. They, uh, they were all sent, a lot of them were sent a letter here that they were gonna get fined $500 per day if they didn't uh, comply with the, uh, the regulations on that. So let's see, should you try to get uh, warranties or guarantees from your dealer? Uh, the answer is, the short answer is yes. Um, getting them to do it is, is a little bit harder, um, especially when you're talking about doing a, uh, like a distribution uniformity five years out from now. It's easier to do the performance on the right, uh, as the system is brand new and it's put out in the field because again, we can go out there and put cups on there and decide we can, we can uh, assess that performance right away and determine if it's point, 0.92 or 0.85 or 0.7. So let's see, so uh, I'm gonna skip that, skip that. I'm almost out of time. The, uh, the drip micro bill, um, there's a lot of questions in the drip micro bill that are real specific to drip irrigation. Like uh, how do we do the adjustments on filtration? Um, the sand media tank, there's a whole bunch of things that are, are detailed questions. Like how do you do the back flush and how is it adjusted? Um, you know, how do we determine if we're flushing it for the right amount of time? Uh, there's questions on that. Um, it's a real simple answer on things like that. You know, if you want to have some kind of a visual aid, um, the right amount of time to flush that is the time that it takes to get clean. I know that's a real scientific answer there, but uh, <laughs> if you can see it, then you know it's clean. So there's a couple of different products on the market that you can actually see those things. Um, you always want to go out there and see what kind of stuff is flashing, flushing out of your filter so you know if you're actually getting the stuff that you're targeting or, or if there's just sand coming out. If you're just flushing sand, you're just flushing sand out of your own tank sometimes, and that's not a good thing. So um, I'm going to skip this slide. I got too much detail here, and I want to get to my last slide, which is our performance stuff. So can we, can we measure this performance in the field? And the answer is absolutely. Um, and that's the topic of our next talk. So, so I want to emphasize this at the end, my last slide here is uh, design is important and the maintenance and is important on these systems, but that design is going to impact um, how your maintenance is going to go. If you're out there horsing around with your system because it's undersized or you don't have adequate pressures, you're going to end up fighting the system, you know, through the years with trying to, to do the maintenance uh, properly. And so it's going to affect the overall performance at the end here. Actually, that's my last slide. So if you need more information, we have it on our website. Yes, we need more information. Like two questions, Stu. What is the software? What is the design software that uh, uh, engineering companies, irrigation companies are using to, to make these designs? You know, where they put in the flows and the lengths of tubing and so on. Are there some brand names out there that you can mention? Um, a lot of the uh, manufacturers have their own design software um, that they recommend the dealers will use for, for like sizing the, the hose. A lot of times it's the hose um, products that, um, that the, the hydraulics is kind of specialized on on those. So they have those available. Um, you know, doing the manifolds, uh, most of that is, is spreadsheet, uh, spreadsheet driven. And so, um, so one of the things we just finished, a, um, we have our three weeks of classes that we do during the summer that are focused on, uh, um, you know, classes for irrigation designers. So we start on basic soil, plant and water relationships and do hydraulics and pumps. And then the last, last week is drip design. And so, so part of the book, part of the um, presentation that we provide is to provide the book, but we also provide, uh, you know, the Excel files that do manifold designs as well as the, the, the hose design. So, so we provide that product um, also, and it's, like I said, it's available free now um, with the purchase or with the, uh, um, when you download the book, it's available uh, through the website. And then another question is, is there a, um, can you reveal 
whether one brand is better than another, is Netafim better than Jane, is better than Roberts, is better? So, is so that's a really, really good question. And um, <laughs> I, can, I can say right now is um, take a look at our long, online content because back in 2012, we really shocked the uh, irrigation industry because we published the names. So, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, Netafim has always been the top shelf um, uh, product, you know, as far as the products that are on the market. Um, I use them for the examples all the time. Um, I, I see them out in the field everywhere. Um, I won't say who the lousy ones were um, since it's probably gonna get posted to YouTube, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say that the performance data that we published uh, speaks for itself. So, so there's two things. One is, um, you know, we, 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 we evaluated some really bad ones, but um, I have to, um, I have to give them credit for participating. You know, I mean, some of the, some of the manufacturers knew that we were going to do this and we were going to publish the names and they still participated. So, so at least they were willing to step up and, and address the uh, issues. But let's just use the sand media one for an example real quick. Almost all the sand media tanks have changed their underdrain designs after we did this assessment, because you know a lot of stuff was going on and it was inside the black box. It was inside those tanks, and they didn't really understand what the process was on good performance and lousy performance. A lot of it was anecdotal, or or just the sales guys trying to make a sale, you know, kind of a thing. So, so just the the short version of this is yes, we have name names, and they're in the reports. Okay. So, would you actually describe what the I I I, ITRC does in the training programs and the lengths of time. Can you do it for a day? Can you do it as a Zoom? Can you do it for a week? You know, should you send your firstborn to, to study there? What can you? Well, we will take all the firstborn. Um, we, <laughs> our program is the, the best program at Cal Poly for uh, application acceptance rate. So our engineering program is at 45%. Um, if you try to get into mechanical engineering, or psychology or ag business, they're closer to 5%. They're only accepting 5% accept, accepting of the students that apply. So, so we will take your firstborn um, and I will give them personal tours and anybody that would like to come up and look at our program. Um, we're, we're always looking for new students coming into our program. Um, but for the non-degreed programs? Well, no, that's, that's, come up? Yeah, that's just if you're uh, gonna do the degree. Now, the non-degree stuff for doing training classes, we have a combination of in-person so after three years, we finally did in person again this summer and we just finished them and all the classes were full and we were happy as can be that um, we were able to do this stuff in person. Um, the um, Irrigation Association has purchased uh, a number of our classes and they have them posted online. So if you want to go in and just learn, learn about basic soil plant and water or hydraulics or pumps, um, they've taken um, well, we did it but they've taken those classes and then made them available to the irrigation industry through that website. So, so we have a few, um, we're gonna launch a fertigation one uh, this fall. Um, we have a few that are available online, uh, online training classes. Um, some of them are, are free and then uh, most of them you have to pay you know, some amount for um, to get on those. For example, the, the drip evaluation one is one that's available online. And I think that one, uh, I gotta look at the cost of it. I think it's around 250 or 260. Uh, to get on that class, it's like a ten-hour training class, and it shows you how to to go do a, a performance evaluation if you if you want to do your own performance evaluation, for example. Okay, we've got some more questions for you. This is for avocado growers. This this avocado cafe. Can you recommend um, drip versus micro sprinkler for uh, avocados? One over the other, or one has to be modified somehow in order to better irrigate avocados. Um, so can I turn my, uh, share off here? And yeah, let's I'm, get rid of that. Let's... I'd like to be able to see what I'm looking at here. Let's see, share. How do I stop share? Stop share. It's, it's the red spot says stop share. Stop share. There we go. All right, there. I can see what you can see. All right. So, so the question is really basic. Do you do emitters or sprayers? And so there's a lot of arguments one way or the other. And, and one grower is going to convince himself that these are, this is a bigger advantage than this, but okay, let's go to emitters first. The advantage of emitters is you put eight emitters on and one of them gets plugged, you still have seven emitters putting water on your tree. That's, that's the main advantage that I see. The uniformity values, we, we have an extra multiplier that we put onto our uniformity calculations when we have multiple emitters because you have multiple emitters. 
So, so, so a 0.95 for a, a drip irrigation system on avocados is very common. And, and I've seen a lot of guys be very successful with just putting more emitters on. Now, now some guys have, have spent the extra money and they do a PC microsprayer because they want to put over a bigger area. They have a water quality problem or they have a, you know, an issue with the trees. They, they, you know, they're on rocky ground and they want to get the water, the roots to kind of spread out a little bit more. They, they have all these reasons why they might do that. Um, and, and I support that. I'm not saying it's a negative. I'm just saying that you might do that. But the biggest problem that I've run into is that the, uh, the irrigators, they'll get these PC products and they'll start getting plugging issues with them with these micro sprayers. You have to have a high flow coming out of them and they have to get the whole tree wet. They go out there and they start seeing there's some plugging issues. And the first thing those guys will do, um, let's see, I didn't practice this before I started here, um, is they'll go out there to the field and they'll take this thing apart. And I'm gonna be able to do it, am I? Uh, I visualize taking it apart and they'll find there's a little disc in there that's that's where it's plugged <laughs> and they take that little disc and they put it on their thumbnail like this let's see if I can get it and they, go, Pew! And they shoot it over their shoulder and they put it back together again and so that 25 percent premium that you pay for this pc product um just basically went to a non-pc product so you might as well not pay the the premium and I've I've evaluated more uh micro spray uh, avocado orchards where that's the case the irrigators making that business decision to make it into a non-pc product so that's it's an education thing if you're gonna if you're gonna go that direction you got to make sure your irrigators not going making that business decision for you to change it from a pc product to a non-pc product okay now you you talked about sand fil filtration what about disc and uh, screen filters what are the pros and cons of each of those three? Uh, sand media works when the water's um, not clean and the screen filters work when the water's clean. So that's that's been my experience. So um, if you have real clean well water and, and you're not pumping any sand, you know, and, and it's an occasional organic, um, you know, snails or something that's getting down in your well, um, the screen filters and the disc filters work fine. Um, it's just every time every time I get a call, it's from a grower who's trying to make a screen filter work or a, or a um, disc filter work. It's because they have too much material in in the water. Um, I've seen I've seen disc filters over in the San Joaquin Valley with the growers that are pulling water from open water supplies, and they're constantly you know complaining about how much they flush, how much they get plugged. If you have any sand, they like discs. The disc ones, the sand gets caught inside the discs, and you can't get it out. So you go from you know one level of uh, filtration to ten times that filtration, worse on the wrong direction because the sand stuck in the the discs. Um, so my 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 comment is if you have if you have relatively clean water, you can usually get by with the screens. Um, the the exception to the rule and 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 the one thing that we use here on campus is the uh, Amiod filters, which are screen filters, but they're vacuuming filters, and they kind of work the same way as a as a uh, Sand media tank. If you get any differential pressure, they'll flush for you. And so those designs seem to work okay if it's a if it's like a light load of, uh, of organic material. Like if you're pulling from a reservoir that doesn't have a lot of uh, algae load, if if you're treating the algae and not getting the algae load into your system or, or something like that. If you know, we have had success with those. I, I will say that. So here's a question that I think you answered already. How about the efficiency of drip versus micro sprinklers with when you have reduced flows? Drip, drip every day of the week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every day. It's it's easier. It's it's um, they're lower flows. You, you have less issues. Um, the performance. Um, I I the first I don't know the first ten or fifteen years where we were seeing the PC market. Um, really take off uh, the drip really really dominated that and it's it just taken us a lot of time to get the 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 sprayers the micro sprayers you know the designers on board I, I know this isn't strawberries but let me just say strawberry one time real quick <laughs> the the micro sprayer industry just loves the strawberry guys because they're putting micro sprayers everywhere out there on those strawberry beds and I'm like shaking my head because they're all paying for the premium product but they run the sprinklers at 10 psi and they shouldn't. They just shouldn't have paid for the premium products because they don't don't have the pressure on those drip manifolds. If they put, 
the pressure that they need, they'd be popping off all their products out there. You know, there's there's a there's a maximum pressure that you can put on row crop drip tape, and and those guys, uh, they were selling product and not looking at design. How's that? Sorry, okay. I know it's not strawberry guys here, but uh, are there any operational cost differences between uh, disc uh, disc sand and uh, screen filtration? Uh, that's a good question. I, I I think the operational or the maintenance cost on it is um, it, it's just relative on how dirty your water is. So if you have clean water, you're you're not even gonna. It's hard to even get guys to talk about it. You know the folks in the field to talk about the maintenance on it. If you have dirty water, I mean we have dirty water here on campus at Cal Poly, and I'm constantly working with these guys on the maintenance programs on the different filters we have and. It's a it's just a constant deal of, of having to on the screens. We're constantly having to put them in acid baths. We probably do it twice, three times a summer um, to get the uh, algae uh, out of it. Um, the sand media tanks, you know, it's it's a usually just a, a an issue with the backflow uh, rates, the flush rates. Um, you know, they never set the flow rates high enough, um, so they're not getting adequate back flushing. So I, I think it, I, that's a tough one to answer just in general. Are, are any of those better or worse for uh, iron manganese um, contamination? Iron is iron's one of those tough ones. So yeah, we I, I'll tell you what I told almost all growers that have asked me about iron is is build a reservoir. I I don't I don't have a good solution. You the problem is you want to keep the iron in in the solution as best you can, but the problem is it, it, the second it sees air. It, it drops out and you end up with iron in your emitters and you can't, there's not any acid in the world that'll get iron out of your emitters when they, when it uh, drops out and, and forms a solid product and you got iron in your, your pathways of a drip emitter, um, there's, there's, you're done. So I, I, I know this isn't a great um, example, but um, I had a, a grower had 400 acres up at, uh, up north and, uh, they ended up putting it all into a reservoir. They put all their water into a reservoir. They had pressure bowls in their pumps and they put it into a reservoir and they took care of the problem. So I, I know it works. I just know it's an expensive uh, option and, and not an easy one. But most, most, if you go in the San Joaquin Valley and you go to these different areas now, I mean, most systems are doing that because there's such a mismatch between what the field needs and what a well will provide. And I think this is gonna be something that's gonna happen more and more in the future as we end up with these crazy drought situations, but um, it, it's a it's a good solution for iron is to aerate the iron into a reservoir. Yeah, yeah. 